Thank you. We are thrilled to be working with such a valued partner, Outright Action International, um, and to host all of you today. So welcome again. It is such an honor to introduce Special Envoy Randy Berry. How fortunate we are on Human Rights Day to be able to host you here. Uh, I would like to take you back for a moment Almost two years ago, when Secretary of State John Kerry announced Randy Berry as the first ever special envoy for the human rights of LGBTI persons. At the time, he emphasized President Obama and the State Department's full confidence. I want to read Secretary Kerry's words, just a few of them. We looked far and wide to find the right American official for this important assignment. Randy is a leader, he's a motivator, but most importantly for this effort, he's got vision. Since April 2015, Randy has traveled to 50 countries. He has worked to promote LGBTI rights, he has coordinated and shaped U.S. government policy at all levels, and he has engaged allies in deepened ties with the faith community. But perhaps more important than what he has done is how he has done it. I've talked to many of you this morning, and over time, those who have worked with you, Randy, and what I hear consistently is how you listen and connect with people, how you prepare for your work in such a thoughtful way. Jessica and I were speaking yesterday about the July 2015 trip that Special Envoy Barry made to Uganda. I believe it was one of his highest level meetings in this position with the Ugandan Prime Minister. And Jessica conveyed how he consulted with outright staff with expertise and with local activists in advance of this trip. And he also took the time when he returned to give a very thorough briefing of what happened there. For 20 months, Randy has done a very challenging job in this very thoughtful way, while he has also been a dedicated father of two and husband. You know, I was moved when I read that a strong motivation for taking this position was having an opportunity to help his two children and all children to be able to grow up in a world more accepting than the one he was born into. I'm reminded of Ted Sorensen's words he wrote for President Kennedy in 1962 when President Kennedy was trying to change minds and change attitudes. If we cannot end now our differences, at least we can make the world safe for diversity. Our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this planet, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. For all of us in the LGBTI community, especially in these times, who better to inform us and embolden us than a caring leader who has motivated so many and done so much? Thank you, and it is with deep gratitude and great enthusiasm that I welcome you, Special Envoy Randy Berry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Camille, thank you for such a, a, a kind, uh, generous uh, welcome here today. I, 
might start out by referring to my, my prime uh, motivators as I, as I go about my work, my two kids who are still in preschool. Um, Jessica, who's, a, who's I'm re very fortunate to count as a dear friend, uh, knows very well that I uh, try to avoid being away overnight uh, because uh, the demands of the job have required that too often anyway. So what that means is when I come up to join you on New York, it's a very early train ride. And, uh, and uh, last night as I was putting the kids to bed, they have a, a, a wonderful favorite book. It's about crayons that are revolting from their coloring, you know, master. And, uh, and one of these is the, the one that I, the page I get asked to, to read day, uh, over and over and over again is, is a story about Peach Crayon because Peach Crayon's complaint to her, you know, five-year-old owner is that he's taken, uh, he's peeled off all of her clothing. And so she's embarrassed to go out of the uh, cartoon, the, the uh, crayon box um, and notes that she doesn't even have any underwear, which always gets cackles in, 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 our, in our house. Um, I was thinking about that this morning because during the night, uh, my daughter was, uh, was a bit sick, so we've been up a little bit. And there are days when it's uh, a miracle when I get out of the crayon box myself with all of my clothes on uh, in, the, in the right order. So if I am a little disjointed today, uh, please understand that that's, uh, so that's the culprit. Um, in addition to that thanks to Camille, I just want to start out by saying how much I have valued and continue to value uh, the partnership with, uh, with Outright. Um, this is an easy commitment for me always, always uh, to accept because um, as I think Camille referenced our partnership and the consultations that we have with Outright and so many of our other partners around the world before we travel, um, is for me that is a marker of self-preservation and success in our work that there is a, a wealth of knowledge um, a supreme sense of subtlety and understanding that I can draw upon uh, when I uh, head out around the world uh, so it's it, there is there is really um, no replacement for that uh, for that partnership. Um, although I, when I'm up in New York, I, I spend a lot of time at the at the mission at the UN at the U.S. mission to the UN. Uh, I spend about as much time at Outright's offices, so I may be petitioning for a desk there fairly soon. <laughs> uh, coming together uh, in gatherings uh, like this are so uh, important, particularly now, as we enter a political transition not only here in the U.S., but more broadly, uh, looking at some of the trends developing around the world. Equally important it is to recognize leadership and partnership, for these are the elements that I believe will see us through to a successful uh, progress. These aspects demonstrate the, sp the strength oh. <laughs> We're good. Thank you. See, Jessica's taking care of me already. So, <laughs> this is typical. Uh, these aspects demonstrate the strength of the LGBTI movement uh, and will ensure its ongoing forward momentum, both for those of us who work in government space and for those of you who work in civil society. And what I'd like to do this morning is really dwell a bit on some of the extraordinary opportunities I've had to experience civil society leadership in the field and to review some of our joint efforts as well. In this capacity as special envoy, I first want to just affirm how much I value uh, the work of civil society organizations more generally. Um, I was asked um, on my last visit uh, overseas, which was in Australia about five weeks ago, um, in a um, I was giving a speech in a, in a gay bar, which I'd never done as a diplomat before I came into this job, but I'm quite skilled at that particular venue uh, these days. <laughs> but um, I, I, was, I was posed a question from the audience to, to, to talk about a, a single most meaningful experience that I'd had in the field, and I found that actually extremely difficult to answer, not because I hadn't had any, but I think it was extraordinarily difficult to single one out. And the answer that I gave then is, is, is where I want to start with my remarks today and to say that uh, the deep honor for me, having come into this space less than two years ago, not with a background as an activist, uh, not with a deep understanding of the currents that were uh, running around the world on our sets of issues, um, but to over the 20 months that have transpired since then, is to be lucky enough 
in 50 countries to see bold, meaningful, thoughtful, creative, and impactful leadership. That has always come from civil society actors. I know you know that. I know who I'm talking to, but I think it's important for you to know that we know that. And that this partnership, I think any success that we can point to uh, over the last 20 months uh, has rested uh, um, largely on the intersection of where civil society activism engages and where government engages and responds. You know, on my visits, I, I listen to the perspectives of a very diverse set of stakeholders who represent different vantage points to discuss how to increase protections for members of our community and from time to time to meet with people who don't think there need to be any additional protections. I think those conversations are important. I frequently meet with representatives and see creative leadership in the private sector, meeting with US-based uh, corporations to brainstorm on how inclusion and diversity affirming corporate cultures can better translate into their foreign operations. I also meet with religious and cultural leaders to affirm that we all have a role to play in combating violence and discrimination. And I have found that while cultural and religious norms vary, responsible leaders around the world agree violence and discrimination are never, never justified. Activists in all regions of the world continue to face similar challenges of marginalization, exclusion, discrimination, and violence. And you are all rising to these challenges so admirably. I'd like to share just a couple of examples that do stick in my mind. On a visit uh, to Istanbul and Ankara back in August of 2015, I had the chance to meet Kamal Ordek. Uh, Kamal is a transgender rights activist who, after being violently assaulted, physically abused, and verbally harassed, did what any citizen should do, should be able to do, and called out to the police for help. Kamal was taken to a police station in the same police vehicle as those who perpetrated the attack. And in the vehicle on the way, Kamal continued to be harassed verbally by the perpetrators. And while at the police station, Kamal experienced new harassment from police officers, as did Kamal's attorney. After enduring so much stress, exhaustion, and deep humiliation from the very institution that's supposed to provide protection, Kamal finally provided a statement of what had happened. And I'm so happy to say that in a decision last month, two of Kamal's attackers were sentenced to a prison term for five years on charges of robbery, threat, and insult. And the third attacker was sentenced to prison for 20 years for sexual assault. This conviction is a step forward since the perpetrators of sexual assault against transgender persons, sex workers, and members of our community in Turkey often go unpunished or receive only the most lenient sentences. The other thing that sticks with me substantially is the, the approach, the conviction, the dedication with which Kamal approached this issue, knowing full well that the possibility of further violence, of further discrimination, of further harassment, and a lack of benefits accruing during Kamal's lifetime were never guaranteed. That's the essence of activism, that's the selflessness of activism. Kamal had the courage and the bravery to write about this experience and continues in that activism. And I know I don't have to tell this, this group that Kamal's story is not unique. We see these incidences of violence and discrimination, particularly against our transgender brothers and sisters, far too often. What is unique is the dedication, is the willingness to go beyond the sense of self for the greater good. Transgender persons face similar types of violence in every country around the world, including right here at home. The trans, mon the trans murder monitoring project, which collects reports of homicides of transgender individuals, lists 1,612 murders in 62 countries, including 90 killings in 13 European countries, such as Russia, Turkey, and others between 2008 and 2014. This is the equivalent of a murder every two days. In Kamal's story, unique courage and strong, and strong voice of advocacy, together with a strong coalition of allies, 
led to justice being served. But it's not enough. It's not enough until all cases receive this sort of attention. And it is our shared work to lift up those voices in their demand for justice, to end impunity when the rights of LGBTI persons are violated or abused anywhere. Moving on to another part of the world, and on a visit to Bogota this past summer, I met with another amazing leader uh, whose story was very difficult for me to hear, and that is Alba Lucia Reyes. Senora Reyes founded a foundation, established a foundation in memory of her son, Sergio Orego, uh, who uh, at the age of 15, um, a bright, caring, loving boy committed suicide in 2014 following discrimination by school administrators for his sexual orientation. Senor Reyes described to me in painful um, and uh, uh, unbelievably uh, difficult detail the discrimination that her son had faced, not only by fellow students, but by administrators and by administrators' failure to act. But she has now ensured that her son's legacy going forward will be used to protect others. Just as Matthew Shepard's death was not the end of his story, but the beginning of another chapter, uh, so too uh, it, this, is, this is the case. Since then, Colombia has taken steps to protect students from bullying, as has have other governments, including our own. But again, more needs to be done. Senor Reyes is an inspiration, and I truly hope that her work will succeed. Bullying like violence is a global issue, and I am proud that the United States participated in UNESCO's efforts earlier this year to document and address these problems. Before visiting Colombia, I had the chance to go for the second time to Montevideo in Uruguay, where I joined many of you to take part in the Global LGBTI Human Rights and Development Conference held in June of this year. During this conference, the Equal Rights Coalition was launched by the governments of Uruguay and the Netherlands. The coalition, which now includes 33, soon to be 34, national governments, is a testament to the will and interest of a broad range of governments to achieve more together in support of human rights of LGBTI persons. And following that Uruguay conference, coalition members met in The Hague to fine tune the coalition's internal workings and, rec and, uh, and structure. Of an extremely important component of that at the outset of that meeting was a presentation from civil society organi organizations so that all of the member states could hear the recommendations. And I am so proud to say that Outright played uh, an absolutely indispensable role of soliciting and uh, providing very frank, very candid feedback, not only so we could hear it, but so that the representatives of 30 other governments uh, could hear it in person as well. Subsequent to that presentation, which was handled by, I believe, nine uh, different civil society reps from all over the world, um, I was approached by several members of, it, of delegations who were uh, present there, uh, some of whom said it was the best civil society presentation they had ever seen. This is because it was directed, it was real, um, it challenged the governments, and I can tell you that as we have subsequently worked to put together our structure, uh, and we continue to discuss uh, these issues, those inputs uh, are at the core of it. For example, one area where I think we can all be doing more is in the protection and empowerment of transgender persons. A number of governments, including Malta, Argentina, Nepal, Vietnam, and others, have passed recent laws that further enable transgender persons to obtain legal recognition for their gender identity in a, in a clear manner and with full respect for their human dignity. The coalition could ideally serve as a platform for these governments to share and exchange best practices, to learn from civil society and other gov governments what new steps, what legal uh, frameworks, and what regulatory structures need to be put in place to build on that success. Governments, in my view, should always be institutions of learning, like the place we are today. And I hope that the coalition will continue to learn and to serve this purpose. In fact, I'm happy to say that just a few days ago in, uh, in Washington at a meeting of our like-minded group in, in, uh, at the Argentine Embassy in DC, uh, Malta has announced now that it will now join the Equal Rights Coalition, which will make it the 34th country. And I think it's absolutely 
appropriate given the fact that Malta is, is on top of the ILGA world rankings uh, and also just earlier this week we passed the first EU bill to ban conversion therapy. That should be praised. That is an accomplishment. And I certainly hope this is another innovation that can be followed. Civil society has also played an absolutely essential role in, in advocating for the appointment of Vitit Muntatorn as the first UN independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity. When the resolution establishing the independent expert was being negotiated at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, I remember seeing a statement from civil society with over 600 NGO signatories from 151 countries. That is incredible. This statement was useful, essential, as we negotiated with other governments and lobbied for their support, and a great example of how groups all over the world can mobilize quickly and influence the action of governments and international organizations. And I'm so pleased that Mr. Muntatorn attended the recent ILGA World Conference in Bangkok and met with a number of activists there as well. His, his appointment is a deeply important milestone that you should understand in the, in the international, uh, in the multilateral sphere. And I know that the State Department, I know I personally look forward to working with his office to institutionalize this work across the UN system. One of my colleagues, Neil Tobias, uh, just returned from the ILGA World Conference in Bangkok, where I know he met several of you. Uh, he had a chance to tell me about them. I will keep most of the stories confidential. In my, in my time, I've been so deeply impressed with all of the, all, all of the uh, operations and work of ILGA worldwide, uh, but I would also signal, signal out leadership uh, from Evelyn Paradis at ILGA Europe, uh, and uh, as well as Monica Tabengwa uh, with ILGA uh, Pan-Africa, who've done a superb job in bringing diverse voices together. You know, there are so many examples of civil society leadership all over the globe. It's, hard, it's very hard for me to, to, to figure out which ones to highlight uh, because I, Jessica told me I can't talk all afternoon. But I will mention a couple more. Um, I wanted to reference uh, some of the activists that are working in the Caribbean, which I think is a particularly challenging environment in our own hemisphere. But I also think the region is filled with opportunities. Uh, all of you, I, I know, are, uh, are deeply aware of Caleb Orozco's extraordinary work in Belize um, that eventually yielded uh, decriminalization of consensual same-sex conduct in that country and I believe has the potential of deeper reverberations around the region. Caleb is a true hero and he recently spoke at the UN General Assembly high-level event about his work. Um, I was deeply inspired, as was, I think, anybody else in that room, including the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, who pounded his fist in outrage at the challenges facing LGBTI persons globally and the need for all of us to have as much courage as Caleb. In many ways, Belize is an illustration of the challenges that lie ahead. While the government in Belize, excuse me, has taken positive steps forward, from Caleb and others, I've learned that securing broad social acceptance for LGBTI persons anywhere is a serious and grave challenge, not only in Belize, but in all of our countries. Unfortunately, 10 Caribbean governments maintain antiquated discriminatory laws, oddly defending those colonial era holdovers while rejecting and coloring calls for repeal as overbearing Western pressure. I find that deeply ironic. Yet I am also humbled to say that several countries in the Americas have developed laws and policies to protect LGBTI persons from discrimination long before protections came about here at home. Caleb, of course, is joined by so many other activists in the region, including who, who have been deeply impactful, uh, as I have learned. Uh, that includes Dane Lewis from Jamaica, Kanita Placide from St. Lucia. I've had the privilege to meet both activists at various functions in different locations and have seen how um, they are able to think critically about their work and identify relevant opportunities to move policy, practice, and social acceptance to the next level. In Jamaica, I know under Dane's leadership, JFLAG is working to leverage opportunities in the field of public health, and Kenita recently initiated a dedicated focus in the Eastern Caribbean subregion. This is how change occurs. 
all of the activists I've mentioned, uh, and I'm gonna single out another Rosanna Flamer Caldera from Colombo, uh, who I always look forward to engaging with and who also brings a remarkably constructive uh, and deeply personal aspect to her work. These demonstrations of leadership and achievement would not be possible without support from the movement as a whole. Activists can and should have different ideals, strategies, and priorities, and differences of opinion. That's perfectly okay. But the more we bring those threads together and work on the core of our issues, the more I know we can all achieve. I'd also like to say a few words about the ongoing commitment of the United States to the human rights of LGBTI persons and to human rights more broadly. Let me say that clearly throughout my tenure, there has been bipartisan support for our human rights work broadly and on LGBTI issues. I am in touch with and receive support from congressional representatives in Washington on, in both chambers and in both parties. Our Constitution, which is the bedrock of American values, enshrines freedoms of peaceful assembly, speech, and association, and it affirms that everyone is entitled to equal protection under the law. These core principles will remain a driving force behind our diplomacy, and I know that I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues at the State Department to be very, very proud uh, to work on this initiative. So in closing, I want to again thank Outright and the City University uh, for hosting us today uh, and the chance to see some old friends and talk about new ideas. Uh, and a special thanks to uh, Outright for all you do uh, here in New York to ensure that the UN system is accountable, for all you've done in pressing me and my office to make sure that the State Department is accountable, uh, and uh, the role you play all over the world. I have come to count on this uh, ability to learn from, from you and your staff. Uh, because I've seen Jessica um, maybe not as much as my own family uh, over these last 20 months, but um, a lot, um, I also should note that um, when I first saw Jessica, you know, I've, I've come up through a career in the, as, a, as, a government, um, as a government servant, so um, I have never earned uh, a, a very big paycheck, so my, my wardrobe is somewhat limited. I always feel a little bit plain when I'm next to Jessica because that, that woman has style. <laughs> but I also, I think I wore the same blue suit about the first six times that I saw Jessica to the point that when I wore something different, she commented on it. So <laughs> in honor of that, this is that suit, Jessica. <laughs> so, thank you all. Thank you.